Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jashin Preet Singh. I'm the technical lead at uh, Blue Sky Analytics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about building a, high, uh, building a spatial temporal database, which will be highly available, easily scalable database cluster with open source technologies like uh, Postgres, PostGIS, and TimescaleDB. How should I go next? Uh, so first of all, like ju just to give you a little bit of context on uh, this is like the index that we'll be going through, right? Uh, what Blue Sky does, what is PostGIS, PostGIS, and TimescaleDB, how to build a spatial uh, temporal database, how to deploy it, that database onto cloud, and where can we go from there? And I'll open it up for Q&A at the end, right? So uh, just to give you context of what kind of data uh, we're dealing with and what we exactly do, this is uh, what our backend or all of our infrastructure looks like. We have satellite data uh, coming uh, at a regular frequency, and then we are essentially creating a refinery to process that data, satellite data, and then put them into. Then we have an analytics engine, uh, which is crunching those data and like creating new data set based on those data set, and then we're putting it into a database, and then we're giving it out on uh, giving it out as APIs, which you can visualize on your platform or you can use it internally. This is very uh, similar to what uh, an oil refinery looks like. So that's that's the analogy I'm using here. Like uh, as we know, like data is a new oil. And satellite data industry itself is quite booming, but uh, the tech stack around it is still kind of in a very initial stage. Uh, one data, so this the data that we have, all of have uh, obviously we're focused on climate change, but the data technical spec is focused in two dimensions, which is space and time. So all of the data set that we have is like global scale, uh, global scale, and it can go back up to years. The other uh, in the other challenges with that data set, or the other common thing in that data set, the data set can be inconsistent. It can have different uh, resolutions. It can be in a different format, or like so. That's what we have to do. We have to make it consistent in a, a single space and time, and then we have to create standardized output that we can store and query effectively. Right. Yeah, so the technologies that we use to build our database are these. Postgres, um, I'm sure most of you know, but just to give a like, basic brief about it, it's, it's, uh, it has been there in existence for two decades. Uh, we can work with structured, uh, structured data, it's battle tested, and it can handle huge volumes of data. And then on top of Postgres, we have PostGIS, which, uh, uh, which adds on to a spatial context to our SQL database. It can store all type of uh, point, polygon, any of uh, those uh, like geometries. And then uh, one thing that uh, I haven't heard anyone saying uh, in this talk, but timescale DB is something that we have added as an extension, which handles the temporal part of the database. Right, so uh, timescale DB is also open source. You can add it onto your Postgres. It just installs as an extension, very similar to PostGIS. Right, so it can handle inconsistent temporal data. Let's say you have a data which has an hour frequency, but uh, so ideally it will be like 24 values in a day, but sometimes the data is inconsistent, satellite is down, or it's coming at different intervals. Also challenges like uh, timestamps, like timestamps can be sometimes uh, very like hourly, it's like we are expecting the data at 3 p.m. exactly, but it's coming at 3.15, but you want to showcase what would the data at 3 p.m. So all of those challenges are handled by timescale DB. You can also use functions called gap fill, which will fill gaps for inconsistent data and other, uh, other sort of stuff where you can aggregate some sort of temporal data in a temporal context, like uh, you want to see monthly data, the frequency of which is one day, but you want to look at it like a single value for a single month. So Timescale handles all those things really well. Last thing is uh, H3 Geo library by Uber. So that's what we use for our faster uh, spatial joins because it has a consistent grid system. Uh, I'll be talking more about that in the upcoming slide. Right, uh, so what are the questions we're answering from the database that we have? Uh, for example, we have a lot of data sets. We have a fire, global fire data set, uh, which frequency is one day. So every uh, another day, we get fires all over the globe from the NASA firm's data. Uh, and we want to answer questions like, uh, what were the California fires on a monthly basis from like in the last one decade? Or you want to look, so another data set that we have is water quantification, where we're, measure, uh, where we're measuring how much the lakes are changing all over the world. So there are about 
4 lakh uh, water bodies all over the world and if you want to look at how much uh, they are changing in terms of size, whether they are shrinking or they are growing. And uh, the data, the frequency of that data set is about 15 days. So every 15 days you will see some change. And But if you want to look at like in five years how much this particular lake has changed on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis, so those sort of questions we'll try to answer from the database that we have created. So uh, you will see uh, that there is a shape and then we have a bunch of points. So what we want to look at is a join of both these things, like where those points are lying. But point is just for representation. You can also have like lines, you can have polygons, or any sort of geometry uh, combining with other geometry. right? So to answer these questions, uh, what we have is just this particular SQL query running on the database, which has PostGIS and timescale already. Right? Uh, so on uh, line number uh, nine, you will see like we're selecting from fires, and we have shapes table. Uh, just just a, gre a brief of what these tables have. So fires is the table where there is a fire. It has a X, Y, it has a point, and uh, there is a FRB value that uh, means like uh, what is the fire radiant power of that fires. And uh, then we have the shapes table where, uh, where there are shapes uh, of all over the world. I have selected admin level two, so that's all the countries in the world, which is roughly about 200. But shapes table is not limited to admin boundaries. You can have any polygon. So you might have your own use cases where you're drawing a particular region and you want to check how many fires are there in region. right? On, uh, on line number nine, you will see I have added two timestamps, which is 2021 and 2022. So I'm selecting one year data. Right? And on line number six, you will uh, see I'm using a function called time bucket. So what this essentially is doing is the fires can be on any particular date. Even if the fires are coming after 24 hours, the timestamps can be varying. The timestamp in uh, like America would be different or India would be different. So all of it would be different. But uh, what time scale will do here is it will uh, remove those inconsistencies. It will say, okay, okay, I want to look at a one month data. So I'll select all the fires within that one month. And uh, another thing that is like uh, optimization on the database level that you can have is that if you're always looking at 90% of the time, if you're looking at a monthly data and very rarely you're going at a daily frequency, so you can tune your database in such a way that uh, you will, uh, it can be like it can be set up such a way that monthly queries are faster. It will segregate the data such a way that uh, if time if you tell time scale, okay, well, I'm always going to be uh, getting like one month value, so you can tune the database to get the monthly values that, like that. And then uh, the most important line here is the line number eight, where we're using a spatial join to figure out if the point fire point is within the shape, right? So that's the most important part here. And then we have time. We can change any values from like date time to like uh, what shapes are we selecting and what is the average value we want. Do we want a monthly value? Do we want a weekly value? Do we want like an yearly value or a quarterly value? So we can do all of that. So this is, so this will uh, answer you all the questions around any sort of point in shape data set, but this is not, as I said, it's not limited to point. You can have polygons in other polygons and varying over like temporally, right? And now, so one thing that I will change here is the line number nine where we're using ST within. So we saw that ST within was uh, the data set that we're dealing with, the fire data set is was massive. So it could be like 50, 60, uh, thousand points per day. And then uh, once we're doing the ST within some time, it would, the query would be running for 10 minutes and we still wouldn't get a response, which is like, obviously not acceptable on any database level, right? Uh, so then we stumbled upon this library called uh, H3 by Uber. So what we're essentially doing here, let's say this is like, this is some shape, this is some country. What we're doing is we're uh, dividing that country into H3 grid. We're taking all of that and polyfilling with all the hex grids that, uh, that, that, uh, that they are there. And this hex grid basically becomes an array representation of the shape itself. And the fires uh, that you see is so fire point can also be converted to a H3 index. And once, uh, so then it just becomes an array lookup where you're just checking whether a particular fire's H3 index is in the array of the shape's uh, H3 array index, right? 
this is uh, considerably faster to just give you like understanding of how much time it takes. The query which was not taking like 10 minutes to execute, it was still running on our system. Um, it was finished within 30 seconds. And that was like the first time I was running that query. Once I ran that query a few times and the Postgres cached it and understood the query plan and analyzed it, it was coming under uh, five, seven seconds, right? Uh, so that's the scale. Uh, to just give you an understanding, the scale of data that we're dealing with here is, uh, the point data that I was working uh, with was about 37 GB. And the shapes were, like we're talking about all the shapes uh, in at the world level. So all the country, like 200 countries, right? Uh, there are also other optimizations, uh, like we can simplify the shape a little. Some countries, like for example, Argentina has really complex shapes. There are too many vertices in that shape. So you can simplify the shapes a little. That will also make the query much faster. But uh, as long as you're doing H3 index or you're not doing ST within, those in simplified shapes don't matter. If you pre-calculate uh, what H3 indexes are there in the shape, it's as long, it's as good as a lookup query, which is like, considerably faster than doing any spatial joins. Right, so I've talked about the database that we had, which is like, uh, it's a Postgres. On top of that, we have PostGIS for spatial context, and on top of that, we have Timescale for the temporal context, and H3 for just faster spatial joins. All this, you can run on your system, you can try it out, load some data, but at the end of the day, uh, you have to put all of this on cloud, because how will you scale and how will you give that data to the public? So for that, uh, initially, we just had a few EC2 instances stitched together and like doing all of it manually using Ansible and CloudFormation and all that. But we moved away from it and we went more, more generic and we uh, stumbled upon like uh, Postgres operator. But uh, let's talk a little bit about Kubernetes just to give a brief, like um, Kubernetes is like where you can run your containers in a cluster environment. They are easy to manage and scale. Uh, you can uh, use like a lot of cloud providers already give managed service around Kubernetes, but you can also set up your own Kubernetes cluster, right? And then uh, we have like Postgres operator, which is a uh, template, like a Kubernetes sort of template for uh, uh, to deploy on Kubernetes cluster that we can, uh, so all the best practices around Postgres, like even if you're just using Postgres to have, to take it to a production level, you have to make sure that it has load balancing, it has backups, uh, making sure that the server is not going down, even if there are like too many queries or if there is a certain kind of load, right? So all of that is already prepackaged and everything available via Postgres operator which is also like highly customizable, can run on any Kubernetes environment, so that way you're not locked to any particular cloud provider, right? Uh, right, so this is what a general high availability Postgres cluster would look like, right? On top of that, you have a PG bouncer, which is basically a load balancer for your database. It's making sure that a requests that on the back end we have, uh, you know, it's just basically load balancing your requ uh, request, dividing it into further, like uh, where this should request this go. On uh, below this, we have a replica service and a master service. That's just a data service, like uh, master service and regular service is just key. Master service is your, uh, where mainly your data you're storing and replica is just a replica of that master. It also makes sure that if the master goes down for any particular reason, maybe the, maybe the region that you have deployed in AWS, that goes down. Maybe the networking is down or maybe there's too much data, there's not enough storage on that particular instance and it went down. The replica can immediately become masters. You will always have one master service deployed which will serve your request and you, will ha you can have as many uh, replica service as you want, two, three, four, five, as many as you want, and the load will be distributed between them depending on your configuration of your PG bouncer. By default, it just uh, low, uh, it just uh, says that I'll spread this evenly, right? Uh, uh, below that, we have like Kubernetes has a structure called pods, so everything is deployed within the pods, the individual pods, and these pods are managed regardless of the service. Service is just in front of the pod that is giving out. Another thing uh, that you might uh, like need is like backups, and you have like a lot of custom uh, configuration that you might want to do uh, with Postgres. That is also taken care of. Uh, like PG Backrest is already integrated in a Postgres, uh, Postgres cluster, and Petroni is there, which is like a basic config uh, management for like Postgres, if you want to tune, tune your database further, like I want 
like 16 GB of buffer RAM or any of those services. One thing that I haven't touched upon in this uh, particular like Postgres cluster is the monitoring services. Like if you're deploying your database cluster and you want to see how it's performing, you will also want like uh, at least Prometheus and Grafana to see what kind of statistics we have around the database, which query is taking most amount of time. So that also comes pre-packaged, right? Uh, so this is all you need to actually deploy a Postgres cluster. Like this is it. Like there's nothing more. Uh, this is like the basic level. You have like this is all the lines of code. Once you set up your Kubernetes cluster, and once you have installed PGO, which is also a single command line, this is your configuration template for your Postgres. You can specify the Postgres version. On line number seven, you will see an image, and you will see like at the end of it, there is written GIS. So this is already like PostGIS is already inbuilt in that image, and you can just deploy it, right? And you can specify the storage, and on the backups, you can just say where do I want my backups to be? It can be S3. You can also do multiple backups with like S3, Google Cloud, Azure. Like it can be in multiple places, right? Uh, so this is all uh, like what we have talked about so far: building a database, adding a spatial context, temporal context, and like making faster facial joins, then deploying it on cloud, right? Uh, things I didn't touch upon in this particular talk, but uh, that would be good to know for anyone who's going to be working with this sort of structure. Uh, with faster spatial join that I talked about in H3 index, even though they were considerably faster than ST within, you might still run into some challenges where the data is too big for a real-time API. Like the use case that we have is I want to request uh, America's fire data of the last five years on a monthly basis. So technically, that's just like 12 into 5, 60 values, right? But to get to those 60 values, you have to crunch so many numbers. And for that, uh, you just can't do it on real time. So uh, obviously, Postgres has materialized view that we used for some use cases that we know that people are going to be requesting. So that is materialized view for that, which you can use like pre-computed values, right? And another uh, uh, another very good way of getting vector data from Postgres is vector tiles. It's very easy to implement. There's just one simple function of like five lines of code, and then you can convert your vector tiles and serve them as uh, convert them into vector tiles and serve them on any of your client. This doesn't work well if uh, you want the data in a textual format, but for visualization, that works great. Uh, adding Prometheus, Grafana, and PG Admin 4, this is like comes inbuilt in Postgres operators. You can add that. You can have PG Admin running, uh, PG Admin 4 running on your system. That way, you can check uh, whether to debug the database on the fly. If there are some developers, you can give them only read access, and they can try out these queries. Uh, so again, like. Talking about like compute in Postgres, talking about the spatial join and spatial queries, there will always be a ceiling that you will hit with vertical scaling. You can have your instance like uh, 128 GB RAM or 1 TB of uh, you know storage, and it's still throwing slow queries. But because what we're what you're doing is running a single query, so it makes obvious sense that once you have hit this ceiling or when you know that you're about to hit that ceiling to distribute that computing. I talked about uh, replica services before where you can have multiple replica instances. So for example, let's take a simple query of like getting uh, five years data for US for fires. So you know that each year, like you want a single value for one year, right? So, or, or 12 values for one year, but you can temporarily distribute that query into five short queries. That way, you can uh, achieve like distributed computing and take uh, advantage of parallel computing. Uh, from my experience, uh, distributed computing temporarily is kind of easy. Like Timescale DB already has distributed computing uh, in their infrastructure, but doing something sort of a spatial distributed computing is something that I have not seen so far. Which is like, uh, for example, you want all of Europe countries' uh, values over five years. So, and you're already splitting them, let's say, temporarily. But you also want to split them spatially. Okay, I'll do each country in a separate instance. But that is something that is not that easy to achieve because there is no standard framework of uh, dividing like admin boundaries because temp time is like consistent throughout. But the admin boundaries change as the country change. Like uh, looking at Russia, it's the biggest area there is. So whenever you're running a query, for example, let's say, Italy or you're running it for Russia, it's going to take much more time with Russia because the consistency is not there. 
One thing uh, that I saw in one of the talks was uh, using SG subdivide. That's also what you can do, where you are dividing your shape into multiple small, small segments, and you can check uh, what the point is lying in those subsegments, right? So, so that's uh, uh, yeah. So what we're so what I'm trying to do with building this database architecture is simulating real world at the database level. So let's exam uh, for example, um, I have to look at the Earth. I'm looking at Earth. And I have to look, OK, what is there in Italy? What is happening in Italy? What is, ha what is the air quality of Italy right now? So I immediately go, like I turn around my globe and I go to Italy. And I see what is the air quality there on a particular day. Now I want to see what's, what happened like five years ago, or what, ha what is changing from the last year or five years. What is the air quality changing? So that's a temporal context. So ideally, what is this is like building a digital globe inside Postgres database that you can basically turn around and see on different parameters. So parameters don't matter. It can be air quality, it can be water quality, it can be fires, it can be point data set, it can be polygons. But what you're essentially looking at Earth in a space and time. And we also have a visualization uh, with the exact name space and time, because that's what we visualize. Um, all of the data, which is like spatial and temporal context, is uh, visible on space time. And it is powered by a database, which is this. And that's it from myself. I'm open for Q&A.